Bloodbath at Orc's Drift. Fayar's Revenge. Far in the northwest of the New World, beyond the lands of the Dark Elves, but standing before the borders of the Northern Chaos Wastes, the Goblin Wars of Ramalir had come to the bitter end at last. An uneasy alliance between the colonial participants of the Elves, Dwarves and Men had united under the banner of the Half-Elf Larian. This mighty warlord from the Old World had led them to victory against the invading Orc and Goblin hordes that come swarming from their nests beneath the Ramalian Mountains of the Northern Wastes. It was Larian's winter campaign in the Cold Hills that finally brought the Goblin Wars to a decisive close. The Battle of Coldfields was the last stand of the fleeing Goblin army. There the Quaykar Orcs, led by King Fayar, were sent into rout from the field. Outmaneuvered and outfoxed, the Quaykar were beaten into humiliating defeat. It was only King Fayar's wyvern mount that saved him in the end. Taking flight into the mountains of the northern wastes, he went to ground and passed from memory. And so it was by unanimous consent, that the free people crowned King Larian, Knight Commander of the Grand League of Romalia. Strong in their unity, the independent nations were able to grow and extend their frontiers. Lawgiver and guardian, King Larian ruled wisely, and a great peace endured for five years. During that time, Fayar, the exiled Orc King, remained hidden in the mountains, scorned by his own tribe, rejected by all other Orc and Goblin tribes of Romalia. He schemed alone, waiting on the day that could restore his former glory. Filth, son of cows and scum of pigs, spat Fiyar, shoveling another pile of wyvern's dung into a bucket. With a hairy clawed hand on, the orc slapped the rump of the huge winged reptile whose penny was cleaning. The wyvern fluttered its wings and shifted slightly. Another deposit of wyvern droppings thudded to the ground. Gah, all your bowers never still, Fiyar scowled. He dropped the bucket and spade and with disgust and his habitual bow-legged walk shambled from the pen. Growling curses to himself, Fiar stamped along the stone galley into a huge open cave that had been his lair for the past five years. Bagrash! Bagrash, you snivelling vulture! Where are you? What's the word from the Quaykar? Where are you hiding, you stinking worm? Slinking out from the shadows cast by the flickering torchlight, the hunchback figure of Bagrash, orc shaman of the Quaykar tribe, crept forward. Greeting, mighty king, scourge of the Northlands, crusher of hearts, Cut the belly crawling, Fiar snarled. What's the word? Bagrash's eyes narrowed. They refuse you still, your awesomeness, said quietly. Cursed mongrels, Fiar raged. Cowardly filth holed up in their stinking hovels. King Fiar could lead them. King Fiar could claim the lands of the white-faced, ply-pushing dungheads in the south. But you are foulness, you must make them believe. Show them your power. Restore the terror of your name. Yes, yes, power, terror. Fiar cried and crooked his arms and held aloft at the stony roof as it squalid the main. But how? He pointed a accusing figure at Bagrash, a fang grimace twisting his face. What of the prancing half elf, the fairy king Larion? It is the eve of the Ramaday festival, old Amalek one, Bagrash replied. The peoples of Romalia celebrate their victory in the Goblin Wars. The King Larian waits at the citadel, the city of Palisandre, and his subjects journey there to pay him homage for his heroism in the wars. Ah, celebration, eh? said Fayar through grated, grated teeth. Bagrash merely nodded. The raging king had fallen strangely silent, yellow eyes fixed on the floor in silent thought. Slowly an idea began to dawn on Fayar, and it was gradually taken shape. He began to crackle horribly. His throat, unused to the familiar action of laughter, began to swell and contract uncontrollably. Ha 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 ha. Adjust your vileness, Bagrash inquired in a surprised tone of voice. Fiar began to whoop and howl like a jackal, his feet dragging into a strange whirling dance. Of course, of course, he wheezed and bayed. What sport, he raved. Revenge, sweet revenge. This they will never forget. Never, never. Fayar's deranged ramblings had risen to a frenzy of malice and spite. He gloated insanely, eyes rolling and teeth gnashing as he danced, his madman's dance of delight. Bewildered, Bagrash withdrew and made to leave. Sure of the Orc King's loss of sanity, just as Bagrash had tried, Fayar suddenly stopped and gestured obscurely. 
eyes bulging, a rivulet of spittle dribbling down from his mouth. He squeezed his fist together, as if crushing a tiny bird with pleasure. You will see, he hissed. You will all see. He began his crazy circling dance once more. Bagrash hurried from the cavern in fear. Fiar's lunatic laughter still echoing in his ears, like the pitiless exclamation of demons set free at last. All day the celebration had lasted. The city of Palisandro sang out in joy and its bells rang out to their message of happiness and goodwill. The Ramaday festival had come again and all the free peoples of Romilia rejoiced. With gladful hearts, the elves and dwarves and men all praised the coming of King Larian, their saviour. High upon the balcony of the king's tower, Larian gave his subjects a final wave and withdrew, tired but smiling. Now the winter sky was filled with stars and the king made ready for the evening banquet. Perian! Larian called to his faithful so bring me wine while I have changed my clothes for the feast. Gladly, my lord, replied Perian with a smile. Gracefully the servant bowed, then turned and ran gaily down the stairs to the cellars. Whistling a merry tune, Larian opened his wardrobe and cast an appraising eye over his large collection of ceremonial cloaks and robes. Still in little doubt, he looked to the royal bed where his doublet, breeches, hosiery, codpiece had been thoughtfully laid out for him. The red, I think, Larian said to himself, lifting out his favourite cloak. Meanwhile, Perrion was waylaid on his return from the cellars, where he found a pressing need for delay, sampling and tasting of many wines. Now, much the worse for drink, he staggered on, landing and tried to make some kind of sensible conversation with the steward of the citadel, who was requesting an audience with the king before the feast. But uh, that's just uh, my point, old son, slurred Perrion, slapping the steward affectionately on the back. King's busy, he waved dismissively. Give him a chance, will you? Hasn't had a moment to himself all day. You drunken fool, said the steward. I'm here for the king's banquet speech. You'll want to know what's in it. So yourself, said Perry, and tottering slightly. Come on, then. The servant led Bay back up the stairs. But he made a slow progress as he staggered his way. Finally, they reached the door of the king's chamber. Away here, said Perry, and swaying in the doorway. With much fumbling and rattling of the door handle, the servant entered. The steward waited impatiently, quietly fuming. A few seconds later, a gasp of horror came suddenly from his face. The king? The king? Here? Here? His face blanched, from body trembling with fright. What is it, man? said the steward, pushing the servant roughly to one side and striding through the door. There on the floor lay the body of the king, curled and hunched in a fetal position. His hands clutched his groin, pained expression fixed to his lifeless face. The king is dead, breathed the steward in disbelief, turning to the sovereign, sobered servant. Master Perrion, he said. Fetch the Proctor Marple. A deed most foul has been done this night, he added sadly. Murder, announced Proctor Marple, the man appointed to maintain the law of the citadel of Palisandre. A murder most cruel, he declared to the stunned nobles there assembled in the dead king chamber. But how was the ghastly deed done? asked Finlay, the king's privy councillor. Felled by a poisoned codpiece as he dressed for dinner, Marple replied, brandishing the offending garment high in the air. Who could have done such a thing? said Finnelly, the mouth agape. Who indeed? Proctor Marple raised a finger. But look you here, my honourable lords and ladies, he said, gesturing to the window. All the eyes turned in that direction, as one as they gave vent to the sigh of disbelief, for there, steaming upon the window ledge, lay a pile of droppings from an enormous dimension. These, began Proctor Marple triumphantly, are the droppings of a wyvern, bewildered the crowd looked on. And what does this tell us? All remained silent. The only wyvern rider ever seen in these lands has returned. King Fiar, orc chieftain of Quaykar orcs. Tyrant of the north, he is the murderer. God only knows the true import of his wicked actions and the consequences of the Grand League and its unity. Our king is slain, mourned all those present. Who will lead us now? But to that there was no answer, save the laughing shadow of King Fiar, silhouetted against the moon, jeering in the skies, calling to the tribes of his people, and boasting of his ignoble deed. Loud and long was the lamenting of the masses in Palisandre, spreading as it did throughout the lands of Romilia, but soon despair was turned to dissent. Forgotten rivalries and racial animosity flared up anew. Without the firm guiding hand of the king, Elves, dwarves, and men began once more to dispute old territorial boundaries. Poorly led and rarely fed, the army of the Grand League was all remained but Romilia's former unity, the last vestige of hope in the face of adversity. 
Meanwhile, in the northern wastes, VR wallowed in his newfound no notoriety. His bold assassination coup had restored his kingship tenfold, and now he's proclaimed overlord of all the orc tribes in the land. A bargain was struck between King VR and Murgol, king of the goblin tribes. As the goblin hordes poured forth into the eastern lands, calling forth the army of the Grand League, King VR and his ravening army made ready for a frontal assault on Parsandri itself. All the land lay open and undefended against King Fiar's bloodthirsty bid for dominance. All seemed lost, and the army of the Grand League had mistakenly perceived the greatest peril to lie to the east. Only when Romilia lay ravaged and despoiled, however, would Fiar's revenge feel sweetly complete. To him at last, it seemed as if nothing could stand in his way.